India, a country of a billion people, and rapidly becoming a superpower of the 21st century. A landscape of stunning vistas, etched from its rivers, sunsets, and religious icons. But I'm not going to show you any of that. My journey will be totally different. What the hell is this? These were men. Full of surprises and very, very bizarre. <laughs> so hold on tight. Well, everybody wants your trousers on. This is my India. City, Delhi, and I'm back on the road, together with seven million others. Hello! I arrived at the airport about two hours ago. Um, I've had no sleep, I slept on the plane a little bit, but uh, suddenly, here you're in the right of the midst of it, it's great. It's wonderful, but it is a bit of a culture shock. This country's overwhelming. A dizzying mix of sights, sounds, and colour. Hello, how are you? You're not going to go behind. Thank you. There's so much buzzing going around. Motorbikes going past. Pedestrians jumping out of the way. Cows being avoided. Some of the food looks good enough to eat. I had a bad stomach when I was at Heathrow. Super. What's going to happen here, I don't know. This might be the only time you've seen me. Day one. The beginning of my eight-week journey to the far-flung corners of India. Surely one of the most diverse places on Earth. It's a country of contradictions. On one hand, you have a nuclear superpower, but on the other hand, they, they worship snakes. So it's a curious combination of the, of the ultra-modern and, and, and the old. It's eight o'clock in the morning, and I'm heading for one of Delhi's poshest suburbs. To prepare me for this trip, I've been booked an appointment at India's most prestigious school of etiquette. The trouble is, my body is still on UK time. Hello. But I've only had a two hour nap. I'm not sure what this is all about, but she's in danger of putting me straight back to sleep. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Morning, Priya Warwick. Oh, I'm Paul Merton. Hello, Priya. Welcome to our finishing school. Thank you. Thank you. Can we do a Namaskar here? Whenever we do something mm -hmm. in India, we first pray to Lord Ganesha, the God of Intelligence, and maybe have the cap on your head, because in India, oh, I see. Yes. we actually, you know, when we pray, we cover our heads, unlike oh. the West. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Okay. So. Priya Warwick is a formidable woman. The daughter of a Swiss ambassador, she speaks four languages. Please come. And has a reputation for not suffering fools gladly in any of them. Of course, normally Priya coaches wealthy Indians on the finer points of Western etiquette. With me, she'll be doing things in reverse. Thank you very much. The trouble is, I never really enjoyed school. Yeah. Can I ask you to sit cross-legged on the chair? Uh, you know, with their legs, like those crossed legs. I didn't think I'm going to be able to do that. I mean, We'll try. I'll try. You know, like sitting on the chair, both the sides. I don't know. I'm never going to be able to do that. Okay, it is a little tough. All right. I'm not all that used to having cooked breakfast at what for me is 3.30 in the morning. Especially goat curry. Can we eat this with our hands? Yes. Yep. So sort of... <coughs> It's so hard to get through. So, well, I'll, have to, I'll have to use my left hand, I think, I'm just so sorry. No, you can't. I'll put it on my back. Use right. Okay. Good. Good. 
Excellent. That was very, very well done. Obviously, I'm going to have to forget everything my parents taught me. What would be also appropriate for you to burp? Right. For your host to understand that you've Enjoy. enjoyed the meal. Supposing I don't have a burp within me at the then moment. Then create one. Create a burp? Yes. No, it sounds like we're being sick with that, doesn't it? That's not a compliment. Actually, I am feeling sick now. And these don't look too tempting. Can I ask you to read mm -hmm. the last sentence here? The food is very spicy and I don't eat spices. Okay. Because a lot of people do speak English, but it's the accent. That's a right. little bothering. Yes. All right. Okay. So what we're going to do is, may I offer this to you? These are disinfected marbles. Right. That we have. <laughs> yes. Can you put them into your mouth? All of them? Yes. A little more. You have to actually stuff them to the right okay. extent. <laughs> and one more on the side, and I think you're through. Is it good enough? Mm. Okay. Now, can we ask you to read all these sentences, please? It's very nice weather today. Thank you for inviting me to your house. No, I think that we're going a little wrong because your marbles are coming here in the front. Okay. Yeah, they have to be on the sides. It's a little inconvenient. Yeah. Okay, I think yes. that's Okay. Okay. It's, a very ni it's very nice weather today. Thank you for inviting me to your house. The sun is shining bright. Now that actually becomes more understandable to us. Do you make out any difference? Yeah, I've got a mouthful of marbles the second uh, time. Yes. Now this is actually turning up your muscles here. Right. So that the strong accent, the strong East Ender mm -hmm. accent mm -hmm. gets away. Mm -hmm. And... It's more understandable to us in this part of the world. Okay. okay. All right? Great. So all I have to do is spend the next eight weeks with a mouthful of marbles. No offence to Priya, but elocution lessons are not going to help me discover the India I'm looking for. I'm determined to avoid the usual tourist trail, but I'm going to need some help to find the inside track. Yeah, no luck, can't see her. I've arranged to meet someone who I hope can give me some guidance. I think I need, I, I need a way through all this chaos, definitely. Hi. Hi. You're Paul. I am Paul. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are nice you? Nice to meet you. Too. See you. Come on, let's move this way. Rushira is a well-connected journalist. I'm hoping she can show me a side to India that visitors seldom experience. What would you like to see in India? I wanted to sort of show oh, you around. It's, I, I, it, it's such a massive, huge place. I don't know where to begin, really. You know, I'm sort of like, I, I, I'm sort of going along the line and just let it sort of happen to me bit by bit, you know. I know I just said I wanted to let things happen, but that was a bit too close for comfort. Not bothered about being knocked over by any of these vehicles coming along here. It goes back to the philosophy of reincarnation, of birth and rebirth. Uh -huh. Because I feel even if I'm going to die now, I'll be born again. So I'll have another chance to do whatever I want another to do. Another chance to be knocked down by a car. But there is uh, one flaw in this whole thing. If I don't lead a pious life, then I could be born a cockroach. So, if you were born as a cockroach, how do you get, uh, presuming that a cockroach is a lower form than a human being, how do you get to become a human? Do you have to be a virtuous cockroach? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. We're now heading for the outskirts of Delhi. Rashira has heard of something she's sure will interest me. The bad news for me is that it involves getting on an aeroplane. Yes, there we are. I'm a bit of a nervous flyer, and I only just got off a plane from England yesterday, so I'm not really looking forward to this. The airport does nothing to allay my fears. 
It reminds me of Terminal 5. But I'm relieved to see that this plane doesn't look like it's going anywhere. So far, so good, I think. So what on earth are all these people doing here? She's never been on a plane before, so she wants to know what a plane feels like. Yes, inside. okay. And what do people do when they're on a plane? And she's scared because she's never got onto a plane before. Oh, right. I know how she feels. I can think of better ways to spend your Saturday, although I suppose if you've never been on a plane, this must be quite an experience. Thank you. Enjoy your flight. Thank you very much, thank you. But I'm beginning to feel that familiar tightening of the stomach, even though I know we're not going anywhere. Are you a nervous flyer? I hate planes. I hate aeroplanes. Have you flown before? No, I haven't flown before. Do you look forward to flying? Oh, of course. Why? Because um, it is quite adventurous and it's quite interesting to fly in the sky and I'm extremely my fantasy to do it. Good luck. Thank you. His fantasy is one of my biggest nightmares. Ladies and gentlemen, take off now. Please fasten your seatbelts and make sure our seats straight. Make sure that mobiles are switched off. I've got to admit, they do make this as real as possible. Since you are stuck in a remote area, you keep surviving for about nine days. So this is the life-saving jacket because... But do we really need this much detail? So please keep all these things in your mind. Thank you very much. This is all becoming a little too realistic for my liking. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Captain speaking from the first page. We are ready for takeoff. Sunset, huh? Yeah. Mm. Not very, not very fond of takeoffs. Oh. That's over. This is the only way to fly. I'm even looking forward to lunch here. Which unfortunately is equally realistic. It's great, it's the best flight I've ever been on. It's wonderful. No stress. No stress. <laughs> There's a real air of sort of like jollity and almost like a party. Like a picnic. Yeah. Like a picnic, a picnic, yeah. An airborne picnic. Well, 12 feet off the ground anyway. <laughs> As long as you didn't expect to actually go anywhere, then everything's fine. It would be a hell of a shock for the in-flight caterers if they did take off. Uh, would you like to see the yeah, cup please, yes, yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, please. Oh, okay. yeah, My chance to meet the captain. Mr. Gupta is a former aircraft engineer who purchased this derelict aircraft and put it in his backyard. Can I ask you, how, how did you manage to get this plane here? I dismantled, I removed all the interior from the aircraft. Uh -huh. Then I chopped in the pieces. This right. was, yeah, this was in so many pieces. Mm -hmm. Then I joined the pieces back. That's quite a big job. Uh, yeah, it was a big job, but at around, you can say, four or five, four, five months, you know. Oh, really? And now it is open for everybody, you know, it is very interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's wonderful, <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. Mr. Gupta's airline is free to those who can't afford to fly. He feels he's providing a social service. Basically, we are fulfilling their life dream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are very much excited. Mm -hmm. And they are very happy. Mm -hmm. And I'm also very happy because I fulfill their dream. Yes. Yes. I have a sneaking suspicion Captain Gupta enjoys this even more than his passengers. He even gets to sleep with the head stewardess, <laughs> who also happens to be his good wife. Mrs. Gupta is a Harvard graduate and her day job is lecturing politics at Delhi University. Oh, a bit of turbulence. Yeah, a bit of a bumpy bit there. 
I, I get the idea, you know, it's a bit like, I suppose, for, for, for me getting onto a, a, a space shuttle or something, uh, uh, you know, I'm never going to fly to the moon, you know, if, you, if you're never ever going to be able to afford to fly in a plane, then this is, this is a great experience. It's funny, sort of like, you know, just with the sort of experience of being on a plane the whole time, did I come back, the first thing I do is put my seatbelt on. <laughs> first thing I do is, you know, safety conscious, put my seatbelt on. Of course, I know it's not real, but right now, that's not helping. They're simulating my worst nightmare. It's not flying I'm actually so afraid of it, it's more than the crashing. Why on earth are they laughing? How can you get so much pleasure from a near-death experience? Oh, I get it. This must be Indian humour. Since none of them have ever flown before, maybe they think this is how we always disembark. Here goes, one small step for my fellow passengers, but a bloody great big one for me. I may not have flown anywhere, but now I feel I've truly landed in India. <laughs> No, it's great. I mean, in reality, of course, this would be a terrifying moment. But here it's just fun. This is the only way I'm going to fly from now on, which means my life is destined to stay here. But that's all right. I'm up for it. Is, is there places I can rent nearby? <laughs> Delhi is a bustling metropolis, the engine driving India towards its place as a superpower of the 21st century. Already home to an estimated 17 million people, it's one of the fastest growing cities on the planet. I found it quite intimidating to begin with, but now I feel I'm beginning to find my feet. Well, hello. Everybody has a very sort of warm, a warm smile. It's a, a wonderful environment, a, a sense of optimism. We're due to head out of Delhi tomorrow. But before we do, there's something else Rashira wants me to see. See, every part of Denny has monkeys. Yes. They're sort of, I'm rather put off by their intelligent eyes. <laughs> they are very bright creatures, aren't they, monkeys? They're sort of sussing us out. <laughs> yes, yeah. You just have to ignore them and walk past them. And yes, them yes. They may look cute, but they've become a real menace to the people of Delhi. <laughs> He says, of course, we're scared of the monkeys, and there's so many monkeys here that they sometimes even get into our homes. He said, whatever there is to eat, they just eat it up. Right. But sometimes it's much more serious than raiding the larder. Yeah, uh, there was an incident where these monkeys got onto the roof of the house of my deputy mayor, chased him, and he got scared and he jumped off the roof and died. So finally the government thought we have to do something about it. But it's not that easy. Because monkeys are regarded as an incarnation of a Hindu god called Hangaman, which means no one's allowed to lay a finger on them. Touch the monkey, you can't harm the monkey, so what, what do you do? What's the solution? Like everything else in India, there's a unique solution. Meet India's equivalent to Starsky and Hutch, star team of Delhi's newly formed Monkey Squad. 
these monkeys have been trained to actually chase away those monkeys. Right. So they see, chase away the monkey by, by bringing a bigger monkey in. That's right. They're government of India employees. So the monkeys are... Government of India employees. They're civil servants. They're civil servants. <laughs> Our latest bureaucrats. So the monkey squad is exactly that. And now it's time to reclaim Delhi's mean streets for mankind. Can you see? These bigger Lango monkeys scare the living daylights out of the smaller Rhesus monkeys forcing them to run away. The brilliance of the scheme is that it's purely monkey on monkey. Well, with a little help from their handlers. These are the noises these monkeys make. Right. So they're making the noises, uh, just imitating the noises so they get scared and run further and further. Yes, away. yeah. Uh, there is one thing that strikes me here. If the guys are making the noise that the monkey makes, do we really need the monkeys? Couldn't they just be walking up and down making that noise? So then the monkeys would be unemployed. That's true. <laughs> and as everyone knows, once you're a civil servant, you have a job for life. But hang on, there does seem to be a fatal flaw in this monkey business. If these smaller monkeys are only being scared away, where are they going? What happens now? They, they move somewhere else, those monkeys, they run somewhere else. That's right, you know, they just move from one neighborhood to another neighborhood, one location to another location. So the other people in the other location will now say, oh, we've got all these monkeys, we need to get somebody to get rid of them. So they come along and, and they move them again. So you're just really sort of just moving them from one point to the other and back again and then back again and back again. Yes, uh -huh. that's the solution. I'm starting to realize that in India, Nothing is ever quite what it seems. Before we fly off tomorrow, I've been invited by Ruchira to join her for dinner with a couple of her girlfriends. Immensely. Namaste, that was very well done for. I've been told that Ritu and Rija are high-flying Delhi professionals, so I'm trying to remember the correct Indian table etiquette. Um, is that how you do? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Have you noticed he's able to eat with his right hand? Sure. Well, so far, so good. So now you have that, then you take a piece of the chicken and then scoop the dal in that. Okay, so... But then, disaster. Absolutely. That's awful. Now we can't touch it. Now nobody else can have the dal. Has to go back to the kitchen. Didn't the teacher in the etiquette school not to dip into the main dish? Yes. I'm not touching it. No, you're not touching it. I'm not touching it. That was a massive error. I'm right on the back foot now. There's only one way I can think of redeeming myself. I think that... Oh, oh, yeah. 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 He thinks that you're, you're a man with potential. That's got him back on the side. So, you're getting good. So the burp is important, but more important earlier on. Absolutely. The sooner we see your potential, the better. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you show off, but say, if you can't eat your floor, do you? It's time for me to hit the road. Leaving the comfort of the capital behind me, I'm off to uncover the alternative India. So I've come west to Rajasthan. Just close to the border with Pakistan is a town called Bikaneer. Which is definitely alternative. My guide, Mushira, is keen we should meet a real-life Indian hero. A man who single-handedly saved this town from certain destruction just a few years ago. The trouble is, all we've got is a name. Yes. 
Bubbles. We walk around here saying, have you seen Bubbles? Yeah, because the bazaar is the easiest place to find somebody. So I'm sure if we ask a few people, they'll tell us where Bubbles is. Right, okay. And Doesn't sound that alluring to me. Hello, um, I'm looking for a man called Bubbles. Uh, okay, let's try further up. Do you know a man called Bubbles? Do you know a man called Bubbles? Apparently, Bubbles owns this local restaurant. Excuse me, um, are you, are you uh, Bubbles? I'm not a son. Actually, I'm Bubbles. Alright, thank you very much, thank you. Shame, you certainly looks the part. Yeah, I'm going Bubbles, eh? Yeah, it's me. Ah, you're Bubbles? Yeah. Oh, hello, I'm Paul. Paul, uh, please meet me. Hey. And I'm Mr. Shiva. Okay. Um, we've, we've been asking in the town for you, and uh, people sort of seem to know who you are around here. For me? Yes, yes. For what reason? Bubbles is a modest sort of chap, considering he saved a whole city. And he took a bit of persuading to show us what he did. Just a few years ago, India and Pakistan were on the brink of war. And here, two miles out of Bikaneer, the Indian army had parked 200 trucks crammed with high explosives and long-range missiles. See the peppings? Uh -huh. These missiles, were they, these, these are sort of missiles that would normally be fired from uh, a rocket or something? Yeah. When one of the trucks accidentally caught fire, it started a terrible domino effect. And it looked as though the entire town would be destroyed. With the soldiers running for their lives, Someone needed to drive enough trucks away to break the chain. Step forward, Bubbles. India's own superhero. I just walked towards the lorries. Jumped in the lorry. First one, I, I switched on the engine. Drove off the road. Left it there. Jumped in the other lorry. And so on the night, how many of these did you shift? Did you move? I, I don't know the exact number, but not less than 15, 20. You can see a piece. It's a shrapnel. Yeah, it's a part of a missile. Of a missile, is yeah. it? Yeah. And so other people, they, they come up to you and say, you've, you've saved us, you, you, you're yeah, a hero. Yeah, uh, the day after, all societies, all schools, colleges, mm -hmm. they, they just gave me a word sort of a thing, like you, you saved the city. There's no doubt that Bubbles was a very brave man, but he doesn't believe his heroic act had anything to do with courage. Instead, he puts it down to his religious faith and the protection of a goddess called Karni Mata. And this is the temple who gave me the strength and the courage to uh -huh. do all that sort of a thing. Uh -huh. This is the, the, the temple that uh, the goddess that helped him to become such a hero, that helped him for his heroic actions. Yes. These carvings are wonderful, aren't they? What these, are these? These are the kabas. That's the saying rats. about the goddess. Right. Kabas right. means rats. Uh -huh. She protects rats. She protects rats? Yes, rats. This is a temple which reveres rats. I see. Okay. Are there real rats inside? Yeah, there are. We've got to see those sacred rats. Will they bite? Yeah. No, no, they're not going to. They're, they are. Okay. Just, uh, Paul, I yes. think maybe we should put on socks before we go in or something. Yes, I've got these. I've got this, this sort of a thin pair. I have a thicker pair if you like. Oh, uh, okay, thank you. Being a holy temple, we've had to remove our shoes. Right, so. Rachir has not taken any chances, and yes. nor am I. I guess the nibble at our feet or something. <laughs> or something. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's go. I'm not a big fan of rats. They've had a lot of bad press over the years. Bubonic plague, the Black Death, that sort of thing. All right, I see. Yes, there's one there. Oh, there's another one here. We're going to walk ahead. There we are. Much more. Okay, so we go further in. There's another one there. Okay, I'm following you. Okay. 
to okay. go sleep up there. Oh my god! It's only worry when there are rats land on your head. According to legend, these rats contain the souls of Carni Mata's followers, the goddess this temple's dedicated to. Here they're revered. I find it hard to get my head around this. And here's the milk being fed to them. Wow. Well, I read a story once. There was a plague which hit one of the Indian states. Plague. That's the sort of thing we should be talking about right now, isn't it? Plague. <laughs> and people who had plague came yeah. here and drank milk from this and got cured of that plague. Did that's they? that's the story I uh -huh. read. Uh, good. Like, there's nothing wrong with the milk. You can, you can. He's not going to do what I think he's going to do, is he? Oh, yes, he is. Ugh. Would you like to try some? Uh, no, not for me. No, I sort of... Uh, no, that's fine, actually. No, but thank you. No, it's really nice of you. I'm finding it hard to empathise with Bubbles here. But he clearly feels a great affinity towards these creatures. Um... I don't know if I should do this or not. What do we think? I can hold your hat. Well, that's, I'm not worried about the hat. <laughs> <laughs> that's your contribution to this little escapade, yes. that you hold my hat. Yes. Okay, go on then. <laughs> I suppose if Bubbles can single-handedly save an entire town from destruction, I can surely feed a few tiny rodents. What a brave... Despite their historic role in several million deaths, they're not so bad close up and personal. Not that I'm going to be using his hand anytime soon. Okay, I think that's, uh, I think that counts as feeding rats, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm just yeah. wondering why I put socks on my feet, but I've been feeding them with my hand. That seems to be something you look to me. Why was I worried about putting socks on? <laughs> Bubbles speaks of how he was inspired by the goddess and he was encouraged to perform these great acts of heroism. So, if he feels that, then that is true. You know, if that's how it is for him, then that is true. And, and, and we, we can't deny that truth. It's just a... It's an odd one. Oh, hello. <laughs> if this inspired him and it saved thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps, then then good. It's a great thing. I never thought I'd learn to see rats as the good guys. But then, of course, I am in India. You can say goodbye to the rats? Yes, indeed. Goodbye, rats. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have antiseptic wipes and things? It's the end of my first week, and we're now in a state of Gujarat. The remote town of Junagad sits at the foot of Mount Gurna, and we're here to witness one of India's most unusual Hindu festivals, Shivratri. I've been told that the event draws up to a million devotees, but right now, I seem to be the main attraction. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? It's a bit of a crowd, isn't it? Hello. Yes. Hello, hello, hi, how are you? Why do you think that is? Because we've probably never seen a white man. You sure it's not down to my personality? <laughs> Lucia has assured me today will be a day I never forget. And she hasn't let me down yet. What is this festival about? It's a festival for one of our oldest gods. He's known as Shiva uh -huh. and he is supposed to symbolize creation with his wife Parvati, also known as Shakti. Uh -huh. So tonight is their wedding night and at midnight is the time of orgasm. So everybody from all over the all over India comes here to celebrate that moment of orgasm on the wedding night. Oh, that's a bit of question. How will some people, will some people commemorate that orgasm? Will they um what were they doing? Was everybody buying ice cream? Look at what happens. <laughs> this is a world away from any kind of worship I've ever known. 
I'm not a big fan of religion. I was brought up as a Catholic, but haven't practiced for years. It was all a little too rigid for me. Bashira thinks Hinduism may suit me better. The houses of gods and goddesses in India. And also, uh, you know, the gods and goddesses are, they don't offer us one rule or one way of life. Uh, this guy keeps walking into me. I'm sure he doesn't mean it. But he likes it. He's probably touching a white man. I see. So. He's going to buy me dinner first. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Cheap dates. <laughs> <laughs> is there a goddess of no, no god or a goddess of laughter or of humor? Good humor? Shiva is that god. That he's, he's the god of the arts. Right, he's the god of the arts, huh? And he likes dark humor. Does he? Yes. <laughs> Shiva sounds like my kind of god. All around the town, tents have been erected creating makeshift ashrams. Each ashram has its own chief holy man or sadhu, together with his disciples. It's a remarkable scene that I feel privileged to witness. And somehow Mushira has swung us an invite into one of the ashrams. So this is the Juna Akhara uh -huh. and this is one of the places set up by the sadhus who you see all around you. Good Lord! I'm feeling a bit overdressed all of a sudden. What on earth has Ruchira got me into? Would you like to sit down here and talk to the sadhus? Yes. Namaste. His name is Sureshwar Giri and he is a holy man and he's been camping here for the last 10 days for tonight. Can I ask him um, uh, why he doesn't wear clothes? Why don't you wear clothes? I don't like clothes. They live like this uh, with nothing because they believe that you have to have nothing to really be able to engage in the mind to know yourself, to right. for introspection. So the possessions are a distraction? Yes. He says, would you like him to become your guru? What is it? Well, all, it all it happens is that they, uh, they garland you with something like this. Okay, that would be, that would be lovely. Oh, Did he nibble your ear? Just blew into the ear. Okay, thank so you. So now you're the disciple. Okay. What do I get out of becoming his disciple? What do, what do I get in return? Spiritual bliss. Oh, I see. <laughs> But I'm still not entirely sure what I'm signing up for. So Ruchira has suggested I meet some of my fellow disciples. Here are some more members of the same sect, uh, the Juna, Juna Akhara. And we have practiced different arts. And one of the arts they have practiced is that they can do anything with their penises. Okay, and, uh, right, uh, fair enough. In your own time, lad. This doesn't happen often, but I am completely and utterly lost for words. So, um, Okay, Paul. This is, uh, I said, what's the purpose of doing this? So he's, uh, these are actions. And if his guru tells him to do it, this is one way of paying obeisance to his guru. Uh -huh. So, you know, your guru might ask you to do this too. <laughs> but just when I thought it couldn't get any worse... Oh my god, okay. I'm assured these holy men aren't planning to have families. But I reckon this is stretching devotion too far. I'm told this is a way of blocking their sexual energy so that they can concentrate on the spiritual. Personally, I'd have gone for the cold shower. That's, that's, that's something of an angle you've got there, and it's, uh, wow, extraordinary.
that I've been invited in. I've heard them, I know them already. I've seen what they can do with their penises. That always breaks the ice, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, what do you do? They want to just chat with you oh, okay. and smoke with you. Uh, okay. Um, what I what I do in London, when I work, um, I work as a uh, I work as a comedian. Comedian, comedian. And it turns out there's another less painful way to celebrate Shiva. These pipes are not just filled with tobacco. For these holy men, smoking dope is a way of attaining the state of Shiva. At least that's what they told me. And I think they expect me to join in. It'd be rude to refuse, wouldn't it? Well, it looks a lot less painful than hanging a rock off your cock. Where am, I, where am I meant to inhale from? I can't sort of into there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I wouldn't normally do this, of course, but one doesn't like to be rude. I know what you're thinking, but of course I didn't inhale. and I'm feeling very much at home. of this five-day festival is fast approaching. Thousands of holy men have begun marching on the street, including my gang, who turn out to be a warrior set. I'm glad they're on my side. We're all making our way to the temple at the heart of this celebration. Shiva, the meditating Shiva, sitting on top of the mountain. Inside the temple is another image of Shiva. It's the erect phallus of Shiva uh, going through uh, the vagina of his wife, Parvati, and you can see it almost as if you're looking at it inside the womb. So let me get this right. I'm entering Shiva's wife's womb to view his penis impregnating her. Lonely. That's the Shiva Linga, which is the erect phallus of the Shiva embedded in uh, oh, the vagina. Right. right. Looks like a plum pudding. The stroke of midnight, and both Shiva and the festival reach their climax. The holy men plunge into the temple's pool where legend has it that three of their number will be lucky enough to vanish in the waters, transported via a secret tunnel to their very own Nirvana. Shame I didn't bring me trunks. I've 
have never experienced worship like this before. Today's been spectacular, bizarre and downright mind-blowing. But perhaps most surprisingly, it's been fun. It's great. <laughs> Where do you sign up? But it turns out my cameraman has beaten me to it. Oh my God, look at what's happened. I wonder what happened to that budgie. Shouldn't have left the cage open. In the next program, I meet the world's smallest bodybuilder. <laughs> discover what happens when a Punjabi police force become Weight Watchers. That's an elephant, isn't it? Experience a new twist on India's most popular sport and join a protection racket run by eunuchs. Grey twins used to nail your head to the floor, she just takes her skirt off. Do come here often.